After a two-year hiatus, the Northern Hemisphere racing season is properly back, and what a season it's been so far. From unknown territory to a familiar favourite. Fast, tactical, offshore, inshore, inside, new, green, and of course, plenty more in Doc Talk. But first, I head to a very special place. There is surely no harbour in the world more famous for stirring up emotions. More tears have been shed in this short waterway than any other yacht racing venue. Tears of joy, tears of apprehension, even fear. Tears of broken dreams. And three months after leaving, tears of joy and relief come flooding out. Ask any Vendee Globe skipper what it's like to head down this channel in Les Sables de Lon, and many will be on the verge of welling up. This is a very special place for the toughest offshore race in the world. Non-stop, around the world, single-handed. Yet, despite the high hurdles that have to be overcome just to get to the start line, the Vendee Globe is more popular than ever before. The next event in 2024 is already massively oversubscribed. So too are the qualifying events, of which the Vendée Arctique is one, which is one of the reasons why I'm here. It's an amazing 3,500 mile race that takes the 25 strong fleet around Iceland and back. It's long, it's tactical, and it heads into the Arctic Circle, further north than the Vendée Globe goes south. The weather at the top of the world can be vicious, changeable, and often less predictable than elsewhere. But while it's a daunting prospect, every skipper knows the Vendée Arctique is also perfect preparation for the Vendée Globe. But behind the scenes, there was growing concern at a weather system that was developing on the other side of the Atlantic. And while the start was a modest affair, what lay ahead proved to be extremely challenging for competitors and organisers alike. So if you've yet to catch up with this extraordinary race, we've put together a compilation of the reports that we ran during the event, which you can follow using the links above and in the description below. A few weeks later, the French offshore team Chira were clearly pretty pleased with themselves as they revealed their skipper Jeremy Bayou's new Imoka 60. It's a pretty impressive video for a machine that is a bit of a beast. She's got huge amounts of volume in her forward sections and an almost bluff bow creating a scow type configuration, something that's very popular in the latest class 40s too. Bayou is always one to watch and this new machine is going to attract plenty of attention once she's afloat. The French offshore scene is on a roll. Entries for key events are oversubscribed and now there's a new class and a racing circuit on the scene. So when the pro sailing tour rocked up on Planet Sail's home patch in the Solent, I headed over to Cowes to meet Sam Goodchild, who gave me a tour of his Ocean 50. So yeah, I mean, here we are in the middle of the boat. The boat was originally designed for single-handed sailing, so it's kind of, and the, the main benefit of this boat is how compact the cockpit is. So this is the helm station. So you can obviously helm here, we've got the instruments and everything, you've got a, a good view of what's happening. 
So inshore sailing, the helm sits here, and, and offshore sailing, you can sit here. You've got an autopilot, obviously. <clears throat> um, but to be honest, when I'm offshore sailing single-handed, I spend most of my life here where there'll be a seat which isn't on for the, for the crude sailing. I've got the computer screen that comes a bit further forward, and then here I've got control of everything. Um, so all the, all the head sails are furling, which means I can hoist them when I need to, and going into a storm or something, you can have all your storm sails up and you can manage it if there's no problems from in the cockpit. <clears throat> so there's these screens that go on the outside to protect the helmsman and the sides of the cockpit, and then there's a roof that comes over here, and you've got these handles to turn all four winches. So really the idea is in this, this whatever, two square meter space, um, I can do everything that needs to be done, which obviously isn't attaching a sail at the front. Um, so um, all the halyards are locked on, there's tack lines, there's every, every, literally everything can be done here. Um, so we've got a system which is called Upside Up, which I think is quite aptly named. <laughs> um, and it's just the, these cam cleats, which is your standard kind of, you see them in dinghies, cam cleats. There's just a piston in the middle. Um, I might, might try and open it in a minute. have got a piston in the middle. Um, and basically, so I can put my, my Jenica sheet, my main sheet, my traveller, whatever you want, around the winch, and I put it in here. And then I can set up on the computer and, and sh several elements, either a pitch angle, a heel angle, or a wind speed increase, so a gust, basically, um, to set that off, and it'll ease your sail. So you're in there. And then if I press on the button... There yeah, so just here we are at the front of the boat, see what's happening a bit. So we've got... Um, a, a wing mast, um, so it's built in carbon fibre. Um, they're not one design, but all, all the boats in our class, pretty much all the boats, all but one, come from the same mould. Um, so they're as good as one design. Um, it rotates, it's put on a ball and it rotates, so we can aim it, it's got a, a, a reduced drag shape, and we can basically aim it towards the wind with these mast rotation arms. Um, so that's the mast. Um, here we've got the dagger board. Um, so it goes up and down, it just basically stops the boat from sliding sideways. It's also quite a big tool of, of safety, because basically if you, if you think your boat gets hit by a gust, if it's got your dagger wall all the way down, it will lean over, and if it's got your dagger wall all the way up, it will lean over less and slide sideways. So it it's stops you going sideways, but also makes you lean over. So you, in terms of reaching and scary conditions offshore, it's, it's quite an important tool. Um, that's its all the way up position, and all the way down is, is two, and, two, and a, two and a half metres further that way. Um, we've got the foils, so we've got one on each side, um, so they're quite small, they are one design, um, that would, and that means that every, on every single boat there's exactly the same foil, you buy it from the class and it is like that. Um, they go down and then the front, the top bearing can go forwards and backwards like that, which can give you more or less lift, which basically will get the bow out of the water more or less as you're, as you're sailing downwind into waves, for example, you put some rake on to help get the bow out. And then towards the front, if we just look here, we got, so we've got the J1, which is a fixed, fixed stay. So by the rules, that has to be fixed to hold up the mast. You can't have all your sails going up and down. Um, and then we've got two, uh, we've got two smaller sails behind it, a J2 and a J3, all furling, um, locked at the top, furling. Um, and then on the bow sweep, we've got, two, well, we've only got one at the moment, but in single hand mode, we've got two more drums for a big Jenica and a small Jenica. In single hand, in fully crewed mode, we've got a big Jenica and a Code Zero. Um, which all go on the front, and that's it really. So six six sails in total. Um, this one being the middle one, two bigger ones, two smaller ones. It's fairly fairly simple, yeah. It might be fifty foot long, but it doesn't feel fifty foot long <laughs> inside, does it? No, I mean the problem is is the central hull is is that wide. So yeah, it's a pretty small living area to be honest. Um, so we've just come down the hatch, which is in the middle of the cockpit, um, underneath the pit and between the winches, and this is basically our living area. So it goes to the back of the boat. And it goes, we'll show you in a minute, but the same distance forward. So it's up to the, it's basically between the mast and the back of the boat. That's our living area. Yeah. Um, living is a big word, but we, I mean, we're crude sailing. You don't spend much time to here. The navigator will spend a bit of time on the computer, but even that we're sailing more and more upstairs. Um, and you come here to sleep and find food and that's it. Really. And single handed, I'll, I'll sleep on the floor here and that way I can get up quickly. Um, Right. I've I've worked on trying to find a way to sleep on deck, but it's they're pretty humid boats, <laughs> so I haven't found any yet. So yeah, this is I mean this is the boat we've got. So chart table screen here, chart table here, sat phone, um, a sleep on arm because we're single-handed sailing, so someone needs to wake us up. Instruments, um, um, pilot systems, and then this is, so this is a ballast tank, um, 
is 500 litres in the back of the boat, so that helps get the bow out as well. Um, and just keep the stern of the boat a bit down to stop pitch poling in big waves downwind. Um, on the ceiling we've got the two water pilot hydraulic rams. Um, and that's really it in the back of the boat. These are escape hatches which give a nice sea view when you're, when you're working in the office. <laughs> um, and then if we go a bit further forward, do you want to swap positions yep, maybe? Let's see, this is your catering arrangement here. This, yeah, this is our jet boil. Um, so that's dinner. Um, we, I mean, for these races, we don't actually do freeze-dried food anymore because we don't have a water maker. We use, um, they, they kind of born, yeah, born in the bag food, um, which is they're slightly more edible <laughs> and, and less bad for the stomach. So yeah, that's that's the kitchen. Um, the toilet's a bucket, and that's um, they're more than you need, really. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is so this is looking forward now from the companion way. So that's so that's the mast bulkhead. The mast is popped on top of there. Um, inside this box we've got the engine, so just a 27 horsepower diesel engine to get on and off the dock, fairly straightforward. It charges the batteries as well, um, but as soon as the central hull comes out in the water we have struggle, we struggle to keep it cooling. Um, so we've got solar panels, wind generator and a hydrogen fuel cell as well to try and keep a few other alternative <laughs> charging methods. Um, and this is we some people we end up sleeping here as well when um, when we're fully crewed, and then there's a small hole here which in front of there is just structure um, so that's not painted. There's, we we store stuff up there in light winds if we need to go wait for we take stuff up there. But um, it's yeah it's not made for small people. It's not made for big shoulders. But <laughs> you go in sideways. Little fuel tank, um, our fiber optic compass. Um, all the wires that come down from the bottom of the rig, there's a solar panel of things, there's electricity, and then here is kind of our, our hub of electronics, um, where there's our autopilot, which is, is a technology that's getting pretty big and interesting now. Um, Mad Brain is what the, the brand we're using. This is the compressor that I was talking about for the easing, the sheet easing system. Just a few weeks earlier, cows had played host to one of the biggest and most famous day races in the world, the Round the Island Race. The renowned British weather can go in any direction, but this year the conditions could not have been better for a classic trip around the Isle of Wight. You can see our report by following the links. Meanwhile, at the displacement end of the scale, the six metre worlds took place in San Chencho in Spain. Compared to the blistering pace of modern monohulls, the six metre class is not a boat that will ever get up on plane, let alone foil. Like their big sister, the 12 metres that were used in the America's Cup for many years, there's not much difference between their upwind and downwind speeds. But these are traits that make for highly refined machines, where a fraction of a knot is a big advantage. By modern standards they're slow, but this makes for extremely tactical racing and with 40 boats from 15 nations, that's clearly very appealing. So after five days of racing, it was Dieter Schoen and his crew aboard the Swiss boat Momo that took the overall trophy, with a day to spare. Sometimes having choice simply makes things harder. I'd argue that's certainly the case for Grand Soleil's latest flagship. On the face of it, if you're after a sleek looking 72 footer, the new GS72 looks just the ticket. Her builders, Cantieri del Pardo, knew what they wanted from the start, a fast, comfortable Mini Maxi. Designer Matteo Polis and interior designers Nauta look like they've delivered the drawings for just that. The GS72 has a long waterline, beamy flared sections aft, and more than just a hint of a boat that won't hang around. But how are you supposed to choose between the two deck options that they proposed when both look this good? On the plus side, in a few months' time, the first 72 will be on display at Genoa and Cannes shows. Perhaps that will help. you probably wouldn't associate noise with sailmaking. But Doyle Sail's latest rock star recruit, Geordie Califat, has a thing about it. 
With a wealth of experience that stretches from America's Cup through the Volvo Ocean Race and Maxi Racing to a stack of Grand Prix classes, he believes that there is what he calls noise in between the theoretical model and what happens on the water. To him, the interaction between the rig and the sails create noise. Understanding it and reducing it by making the two sides work together is the key. The factors that lead to load on the rudder is another example, as is the full hydrodynamic package and interaction. So in a world where it's becoming harder to find gains, Califat believes that listening to the noise can deliver some of the answers. Paint manufacturers Nautix are used to receiving requests and feedback about creating and adapting marine coatings. But the request from Vendée Globe skipper Roland Jordan was rather different. Nautix is well known for its anti-fouls and for its reins of adhesion promoters for glass, carbon, steel and aluminium. But Jordan wanted to talk about decks and how his had been a nightmare. During the last round the world race, he called his shore team every time he ventured outside the cockpit, telling them that if he didn't call back in 10 minutes, he was in the water. So to address his concerns, Nautix developed a transparent deck paint so that sponsors' graphics remain clearly visible. It's now a standard product and has been further adapted to suit certain parts of the boat. Hard in the cockpit and softer on the side decks to avoid rope abrasion but effective throughout to prevent unnecessary calls home. In the pro sailing world, Cascai in Portugal is a favourite. Its open waters and reputation for breeze and big waves often make for spectacular racing. The TP52s have been there many times before, and this year it was for the Rolex TP52 World Championships. But much to most teams' disappointment, the breeze was late to the party, making the first four days light, tricky and highly tactical. But by the final day, normal service had been resumed, with 22 knots of breeze across the course. This was the day to watch, and here's what happened. Race 9, the breeze is up. Cascais finally delivering 19 to 22 knots of wind on the start line from the northwest. The swell is building in a great climax to the regatta. Platoon look best off the start line. Time on distance towards the pin end of the line. They are over the top of quantum uh, early on. But the race is to get to the right. It's a really typical Cascais race course. Quantum get inshore and get the pressure and the shift. They just turbocharge past Platoon and put Allegra in between them. Down the uh, run and the win is with the quantum racing their first win of the regatta. Second race, the breeze is much the same, perhaps just a little bit more wind uh, on the start line. Allegri can make a really nice start off the pin end of the line and they get the early lead up the first beat. Interlodge and Prevetsa and Sled all go to the right, get out to the right early. And at the top mark, that's the lead with Allegri and uh, Prevetsa doing nicely down the first run. But Phoenix, Bayou, Quantum and Platoon all get closed out and uh, are deep, deep, deep coming round the top mark. But uh, down the first run, Prevetsa stay left and take the lead at the the lured gate, the platoon there right down at the back of the fleet, Quantum Racing just a one place ahead of them and through the finish line, well it's a win for Prevetsa but Quantum Racing take the World Championship with platoon behind them. We got a couple of breaks in there to stay in the game, you know we could have sailed better and hats off to Quantum because they sailed fantastic. <laughs> You, know, you kind of take the good with the bad, and, and you know it's ironic because I'd say the previous four days we started really well, and today we didn't start great. We were probably a bit conservative. We all have right on the brain, but how you get there is the tricky part. And um, I you'd give Allegra and Platoon high marks for just backing themselves there. Doug brings a different dynamic to the boat and to the team. To be able to share this with him is awesome. It just felt great to be on board. For many years, I, you know, there would be world championships that I couldn't attend and the team would sail and did well, but for the opportunity to, to be on the boat to sail in a championship, the, the Rolex championship is just uh, pretty special and to, to win is fantastic. So the final standings, Quantum Racing win on 33 points, second our platoon on 40 points, Allegra on 41, Phoenix 42, Sled on 44 in fifth. The 52 Super Series standings after two regattas, Quantum Racing lead on 52 points, second our platoon on 66 points, third our Phoenix on 69 and Allegra fourth on 84. So in the end, a great week's racing here in Cascais. Light winds for most of the week and a big finale with 20-25 knot breezes 
on the final day. Quantum Racing coming out on top, but it's been a fantastic week. And for sure, we're going to be coming back to Cascais. Back in 2004, when the America's Cup moved to Europe for the first time after the Swiss team Alinghi defeated the Kiwis in Auckland, I discovered Spain. In particular, Valencia, where the 32nd America's Cup was hosted in 2007. I loved it and still do, and it doesn't take much to get me down there. So when Nautor Swan invited me to come down and check out their Club Swan World Championships, I didn't have to ask twice. The company has always been well known for its success in both cruising and racing, but in recent years their one design fleets have become very popular with some great events and a strong showing. The links above and in the description will take you to our feature on the Club Swan One Design Worlds. Now, up here in the Northern Hemisphere, the sailing season is well underway and I'm delighted that Dee's back with us because uh, she's been out on the water and she's going to tell us what you've been up to. What, what's the latest? Well, it seems to be just ramping up really quickly. Suddenly we seem to be racing every other weekend and most recently was the Myth of Malham. So that's the longest race to date in our campaign, the longest time Shirley and I have spent on the water together. Two nights and it goes out towards the west, round Eddiston Lighthouse off Plymouth and back towards the Solent again, just finishing just outside. How many miles is that? It's about 230 miles, so it was a bit of a test. It gave us a little bit of everything, huge transitions, big tidal gates that weren't always in our favour. I think we managed to write the name of our boat in our track. Uh, and super competitive as always, which the Sunfast 3300 definitely is. Mm. And how many um, how many boats in the fleet? There were 22 in the double-handed fleet, and there was about 15 Sunfast 3300s. So just our own fleet alone was competitive enough, let alone everybody else. Yeah, and the breeze. What kind of breeze did you have? We started off in nice, really nice downwind conditions. We got out the solar really quickly. An interesting transition in the Needles Channel that caught a few people out. We went from beautiful spinnaker running to reaching with code zeros. And a few flapping kites around we were late for that transition as well and then it was pretty much downwind to the to the rock round the lighthouse in at sunrise which was perfect and then as we came back we had this big transition at Portlandville which is a really vicious tidal race tide was against the wind was kind of shifty to nothing and we worked really hard and then it was upwind to the finish and actually we finished just as the tide turned against us and 25 knots bowled through from the east through the Solent so getting home to Cowes was probably the toughest bit of the race. <laughs> How did it go? How did you feel it went? For us, it was a better, it was a step in the right direction, a better race. We had much more consistency. We were proactive on our sail changes. We still haven't quite translated to that into performance on the water, and we're still getting nailed by quite a few boats. But we had really good boat speed. We seemed to be stuck to Atomic, another 3300. Didn't matter what we did, we always came together. And we crossed the finish line ahead of them, but corrected out the other way around. But it was, it was good for us, we felt much better. So I think we're moving in the right direction. And we're fearful now that the Rourke season, the offshore racing that we're having, seems to be dominated by light winds. And it did that last season, and then we all got absolutely nailed in the fast net. So we're fearful now that this will be another light season, all building up to getting nailed at around Britain and Ireland. So we need to manage that a little bit. Is there anything you can do about that? I mean, would you go out, if it's really blowing, will you go out and go and test yourself? Well, we did have an interesting sail a couple of weeks ago in 28 knots, um, which was good for us just to bed everything in and stretch everything out because everything's still new. It still seems to be changing every time we sail. But you don't often choose to put yourself in conditions <laughs> like that, but we're going to have to. Yeah. What about the rest of the fleet? Because it is, as you've already alluded to, it's a very competitive fleet. Who are the people that you're looking out for? Who are the people that are impressing you? Well, it's really interesting. My old boat from last season, Gen 2, is now called Red Ruby with American owners. They're coming over here to race in this fleet because it's so competitive and they're doing really well. They're cleaning up quite well, really? they're dominating. But there's no one boat that's winning everything. So there's still a lot of changes and I think that's really nice for the class and allows people to realise that it is possible. And everybody's kind of just swapping positions, but they've really impressed me. But I have a, I have a soft spot for that boat. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sure you do, yes. Anybody else? Because when I look down the list, and I'm not as familiar with it as you are, but there are people who've, who've been in there, Deb Fish, for example, is, is one of them, uh, who've been in the shorthanded scene for a long time, and they're right up at the front of the fleet, aren't they? Yeah, there's certain names like Bellino, like Jangada, where you look at where they are, and because they are used to dominating this double-handed fleet, if they're in the same place you are, you know you're in a good place because they're not going to make a mistake. So there's some references that you can have definitely in the fleet, but there's some new blood coming in that are doing really well, really getting their boats to perform. And it's been really impressive. What do you think the, the old hands, to call them that, but the people who've been in this class and this fleet for some time, what do you think they've got that you haven't yet got? Well, the Rourke races are very repetitive and quite traditional. Like they probably know this South Coast like the back of their hand. I mean, I'm very confident in the navigation, but knowing where to position yourself for the wind shift or the tide or those little back eddies that you may get around Portland Bill, you know, there's a few little signs where I'm like, oh, I may have missed that. I should have looked at that. So you get to know these waters really well. And they've been doing it for more years than I have. I've been off around the world while they've still been sailing this coast. So you may think it's repetitive, but actually it's practice makes perfect and you can't unlearn the experiences you've had. So I think that experience pays into their, their hands. That's really interesting. I was expecting you to say it's the dynamic of double-handed sailing um, on a small boat, but does, I mean, I'm sure that is a factor as well. It is a factor, but you know, there's some strong combinations. There's people coming together for the first time that are just clicking and making it work. And as long as you have clean maneuvers, you can basically sail the boats. The boats are really fun and easy to sail, but difficult to sail well, but it's the little, nuances that will give you that little advantage if you're all stuck in light winds and you've got to find that break somewhere getting that new wind first or getting that back eddy or being in the position for the turn of the tide at the right time is quite key sometimes and it's just those little little shifts that give somebody the advantage because the difference is in the fleet is like 20 minutes from front really? to back so that there isn't a lot of difference there mm. and what's been the big surprise so far for you the I sailed this boat last year. I'm sailing the same boat this year and it's still just as hard. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found out what it is yet. You know, you're still working really hard and making mistakes. And it's about making the fewest mistakes, as we know, as every race is. You've got to make some strategic and tactical decisions and you've got to execute with minimal mistakes. And, you know, you're never going to be on top of your game all the time. Your fatigue plays in, sail changes, choices. And you've got to make those decisions right. And obviously we're thinking big picture of around Britain and Ireland and that's going to be all about making the least mistakes. Well, good luck. Thank you. Come back and tell us how it went. I will do. Fingers crossed we have a good race. Good. As an activity, sailing must surely be as green as it can get, isn't it? When it comes to the power source, of course, the answer is yes. But among the various elephants in the room are the materials that we use, and that includes sails. Sailcloth manufacturers Dimension Polyant are well aware of this and have created a material that they claim is 100% climate neutral. The core material is naphtha, a byproduct from the timber and pulp industries, and is used to make ethylene, which is the first step in the process. The bio-based Dyneema that's produced is said to have the same levels of stretch resistance, strength and durability as conventional Dyneema, but with a fraction of the carbon footprint, which is certified by the ISCC. And it's this material that's used to produce Hydronet sailcloth. When it comes to the world's super yachts, we've got used to being impressed. Who wouldn't be? Sail plans big enough to cause a solar eclipse make for quite a spectacle. But have you seen what handles them? This is a complete set of Rondal aluminium captive reel winches for a 60 meter sloop, which makes it easy to see why weight has become increasingly important. To address this, Rondal have created a new range of carbon fiber captive reel winches that are 22% lighter than the aluminium alternatives and the benefits of saving weight go further for designers. For example, the weight of supporting structures can be reduced. Lighter winches also allow greater scope when it comes to their locations in the boat. Two of several reasons why lighter winches look set to trigger another round of innovative thinking and impressive performances across the biggest boats in the world. 
It takes a long time to build a quality composite structure, not least because of the time it takes to get the air out of the laminate, or debulk as it's known. Then there's the time spent in the autoclave. But composite experts Hexel have developed a new range of prepregs that avoids this and saves huge amounts of time. Their system is called G-Vent and comprises microscopically thin layer of material that's integrated within the prepreg carbon fibre. It acts as a network of pathways that allow the material to vent as the resin cures. What is particularly impressive is that when tested by an independent, non-destructive testing facility, the structural results were comparable with those of the same laminate thickness achieved in an autoclave. G-Vent was originally developed for commercial ship wings, but is finding favour with the racing world. And with those kinds of key time and cost savings, it's hardly surprising. She's almost as tall as an Imoka 60 and has an impressive sail plan to match. A builder's claim she'll reach along at 18 knots and barely upset the fruit bowl on the saloon table. And even then, she's not at full throttle. Nowhere near. The ORC 57 is a striking looking racer cruiser cat. Built by Marsauden Composites, she's been designed by Mark Lombard. Her potent performance under sail is offset by a strikingly comfortable cruising layout below decks. Her interior has been engineered to keep the weight down and performance up, while still maintaining a slick modern feel. Further evidence that this is a design that is aimed as much at fast cruising in comfort as it is winning her division in races like the Fastnet, Caribbean 600 or a transatlantic dash. The international moth class has played a big part in the development of foiling across the sport. Yet what you may not know is that the foiling moth is also the focus of attention for another area that could influence the way that we go about building the next generation of boats. The Sumoth Challenge, short for Sustainable Moth, is an event that takes place on Lake Garda. It's now in its second year and one of the teams that took part was Southampton University. It's led by ship science graduate Hattie Rogers. And if you think that name rings a bell, there's a good reason. She's just won the women's nationals in the WASP class, again. She's the GP WASP Inspire Racing female champion. She's the daughter of designer Simon Rogers, who is the son of legendary boat builder Jeremy Rogers. So it was pretty good to catch up with her before she went out to Garda to reveal her team's entry for the Sumoth Challenge. Hattie, lovely to meet you. Before we talk about this project, first of all, tell us, what do you do? What are you, what are you up to? Um, so I'm 22. I've just finished my master's in ship science engineering at the University of Southampton. Um, so along with uh, all of my other um, teammates in this group, uh, so this is our group design project in final year um, that we've been working towards, and there's six of us. And uh, yeah, so we just finished our masters all together. Fantastic. Busy time, I would imagine. Very busy, yeah. <laughs> now, this is for the Sumoth Challenge, isn't it? Just before we, again, before we talk about the boat, tell us a bit about the Sumoth Challenge. What is it? What's it trying to do? Sure. So, um, the Sumoth Challenge was invented, I guess you could say, uh, by Luca um, Rizzotti. Um, so, it's kind of formed on the back of uh, Foiling Week, so it forms uh, part of that in Lake Garda. The Sumoth Challenge has um, been happening for the last uh, three years and basically um, it's a student competition that's run internationally and uh, yeah everyone comes together makes their makes their boats and then basically races in, in Lake Garda. And Sumoth being short for sustainable moth. Exactly yeah, yeah yeah. Yeah okay so tell us a bit of, tell us a bit about this project your particular your particular entry. Obviously, it's the first time the University of Southampton's entered. So uh, I think just getting a boat and, and well, not getting a boat, manufacturing a boat um, and having a boat at this stage is amazing for us, uh, just uh, having it. And we've decided uh, to really focus on the sustainability with the alternative materials. Um, so we've used uh, flax, PT, recycled cores, uh, cork cores. Um, we've used uh, like bioresins. And I think with our particular project, we've really tried to bring um, all different areas of the industry together. And um, yeah, it's, it's been great. What, what do the rules say? So do the rules tell you, are there certain limits that you have to work to? How, how does that work? So the whole 
could have a maximum of 20% CFRP, whereas the foils CFRP. Uh, carbon fibre reinforced plastics. Um, and then the foils could have a maximum of 80%. So we had to abide by those and, and plan out what we were going to do. Um, the other thing with the Sumoth challenge that is quite unusual is that the, the sustainability is, uh, is effectively ranked. And so you have um, a Sumoth dollar system where the more sustainable the material is, um, the cheaper the, um, the cheaper it is effectively by mass. So it means that if your boat is super unsustainable, you're closer to the maximum of 10,000 Sumoth dollars. Tell us a bit about the um, materials that you've used. I mean, the most obvious thing is, is the wings, isn't it? Beautiful laminated yeah, yeah. wooden wings. Um, but what about the rest of the boat? What have you used? And you mentioned flax. Yeah, so um, we've used flax throughout the hull. Um, so we've used uh, different layouts depending on the area. So around um, the mast, there's a bulkhead, a V-shaped bulkhead that runs just here. So we've used, decided to use two layers of cork as the core, um, just for a bit of um, a bit of structure, basically. Um, and then in the bulkheads, we've used one layer of flax, uh, so plus minus 45, and then the five mil PT, um, and then. Uh, the whole hull shell we used, I think it was uh, three layers of flax and then PT and then two layers. Um, so those, it was quite tricky with this one because obviously we were quite time pressured with the uni um, deadlines. So we had to go quite quickly into the manufacture in December. Uh, so uh, yeah, we didn't have much time to post process all the material testing, but we had a rough idea um, based on that. What does it, it weigh? Um, so all up with 62 kilos, um, which is quite a lot more than uh, the newer kind of aeroset type um, moss. So I think that's about 60% greater. But I think um, because we kind of rushed into the manufacture quite a lot, I think it could be quite a lot lower. Um, I think uh, the university is going to take this boat and hopefully uh, do further projects with it and have a Mark II, Mark III and use uh, the lessons learned basically in the manufacture. It looks like there's quite a few recycled materials here as well. Um, so the sail we've adapted from an old Maguire kind of 2010 era that was literally in the back of a, um, a container uh, in New Milton. So we've, uh, Sanders have really helped us kind of modify that to make it fit the rig. Um, the, the mast was an old Mac 2 mast that, um, that wasn't being used by a friend of ours. So he kind of donated that. Um, the boom, we were given the front half from uh, Maguire again, so we had to build the back half. Um, what else? Oh, the gantry was, again, it was going to be thrown away, but we've modified it so that it fits the boat. Um, I think also with these uh, moths, obviously, they're not one design, so one thing might fit one boat, but um, might not fit another. It's a fascinating project uh, and a fascinating exercise. How far do you think this can go then? Well, it's interesting because um, I think especially working with industry, maybe, um, I mean, not, I don't know for sure, but it's definitely got people thinking. Um, and this whole vision that Luca with Foiling Week has, I mean, he started Foiling Week, I think it's his 10th anniversary this year. Um, so he's been a massive uh, player in making all of this happen and getting the industry to really think. Um, I think the biggest thing out of this project and the biggest success was um, the bioresins. So we uh, have been working with Matrix Composites to make that work and it was a material that um, none of us have used in infusions before. So um, I think that can be definitely transferable to industry. Well, well done, it, it's fantastic. I really look forward Thank to you. seeing how you do. <laughs> Just a few hours later and Hattie was on the water and flying. So, aside from the competition that lay ahead, in my book, success, tick. So, once again, and as always, thanks so much for watching. Once again, a big thanks to our sponsors and partners. And if you'd like to join them, we'd love to have you on board. Meanwhile, if you haven't yet subscribed, please do. It's free and it makes a big difference to spreading the word. So now it's time to get stuck into the second half of the summer season and there's plenty more to come. 
let us know what you've been up to as well. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, until next time.